Oh God! All right. Oh, all right. Thanks. Move that out of there. Good to go. All right. Uh, I will try and talk clearly for the people online. Uh, today's going to be talking about database migrations primarily. A um, little forward, I wanted to kind of include some fine tuning stuff for parameter groups with RDS. Um, so, what I'll do with that stuff, because I probably won't have time for it, I'll just make myself available if you're interested in fine tuning your database. And uh, we can nerd out over some parameter groups. Um, so, who am I? Uh, my name is Patrick Delaney. Uh, I used to work for a company called Avnet doing uh, ITAR, International Trade and Arms Regulation. Uh, more boring than it sounds, it's basically just can this chip be used in a missile, can it not, looking at temperature, chip manufacturers all day, not as exciting as you would think. Uh, I did network security at Barracuda for a long time. Uh, I work primarily on their VPNs and their firewalls there. And I'm an SRE at uh, RightBrain. Uh, so today, yes, I'm going to be talking primarily about moving your on-prem database uh, to MySQL, or RDS, I should say, Aurora my, mainly, uh, but coming from MySQL and Postgres. Uh, so the first thing I want to go over is benchmarking. Um, if you're going to move to RDS, you want to make sure it's worth your while uh, or worth your time. Uh, benchmarking is going to be your best friend for that, of course. Uh, from personal experience, most of the benchmarking tools I've found online kind of fall short. Um, but I do like Sysbench, and uh, there's a couple of good ones from Percona, too. So I suggest kind of going out there, finding ones that work best for you. Um, and also reach out to the people that make those tools. You'll find funny things like it's broken, but they don't have that publicly available. You have to <laughs> find out from one of them that it doesn't do what they think. Um, the other thing is, if you find a better solution uh, outside of RDS, you know why why move into RDS just to kind of be with the you know hip using you know our, our, all of AWS services. Uh, so benchmarking can help you find that. Uh, so a few things with benchmarking: uh, Sysbench 0.5 uh, allows for custom Lewis scripting. This is really nice because you can kind of tailor your benchmarking to your specific data set. Um, before they didn't have that, uh, so that's actually like really, really cool. Uh, you can totally script any kind of benchmarking you want. You don't have to go just with their standard OLTP TS, uh, tests. Uh, IOSTAT, uh, freely available on most Linux distributions, uh, and it's really easily parsable if you put it into CSV. So if you're trying to get, uh, I, I should also say that this won't work on RDS for you. You don't have access to the underlying file system. So this would be your benchmarking your own system first. Uh, but IOSTAT's really helpful for that. If you're getting a good idea uh, on IOPS, really, you would look at like the time to wait uh, for your machine. And that would kind of uh, roughly equivocate to IOPS uh, in Aurora or RDS. Uh, PT Query Digest, I really like that one for uh, general and slow query log playback. Uh, that's good if you're trying to replay just your own data that you've already got on another server. Uh, query cache, InnoDB buffer pool, these are going to change a lot depending on your data set, how, you guys, how your application interacts with your database. Uh, query cache can often make things less efficient. Uh, InnoDB buffer pool, most folks are fine around 75%, but you might start bumping into your other you know, caches if you kind of have it up too high. Uh, scaling your testing. I always recommend kind of starting at a low thread count and working your way up to a large thread count if you're expecting a high concurrency database uh, or if you want to kind of push the limits of the, uh, you know, your client side or server side connection pooling. Uh, the other thing to note with benchmarking is that if you're doing like an apples to oranges kind of thing with Postgres and MySQL, Postgres is going to be much more uh, con conservative by default with their configurations. So if you're comparing the two, just keep that in mind. Uh, unwieldy architecture. <laughs> uh, so these are kind of just things that most folks probably aren't going to run into in a bigger, uh, more corporate environment. I have seen it sometimes in like smaller businesses. Uh, somebody decided that sharding was a needless complication. They didn't want to get into it at the time. Now they don't have any sharding and they've got a ton of data. Uh, so this little guy over here, this is how I kind of describe sharding for folks who aren't familiar. Uh, if you've ever had an encyclopedia, this is way easier to move around and find what you need than this. This guy's not having a great time. See, what have I done? <coughs> um, things are enormously lopsided. This is usually more due to how we kind of format our models and stuff like that. Uh, it's good to have everything kind of 
if we're going to go table by table in migrations, if we have complex tables and things like that, it's best if they're all relatively managed. Uh, and that kind of ties into ETL procedures. Uh, if you've kind of just let the database clutter up a lot, and there's a bunch of irrelevant data there, or archive data, or something like that, uh, that doesn't need to be there, that'll cause added time, I guess, to the migration. Uh, and the last one's really just sort of if you're on uh, more, I guess, scant uh, physical resources. So whoever did the underlying file system didn't set up anything correctly. Or maybe they just didn't take the time to fine tune it to a database. Uh, if you're using like Oracle hardware and stuff like that, usually not the case. Uh, but if you've just got like some kind of beige box, run into it a few times. Uh, change is unavoidable. So this is one of my <laughs> favorite little clips there, old manuals at cloud. Uh, so this just means that we kind of didn't take advantage of new technologies when they started to emerge. Uh, I usually only see this in like way older databases. Folks are still using MyAzam when they could be using NODB. Uh, that row lock over table is huge uh, for performance. Uh, we, the information schema, that's going to be more for if you're going from uh, MySQL 5.7. Uh, they're going to start shifting over everything to the performance schema table. Uh, and the information schema table is going to get referenced a lot less. And it's, it's going to be phased out. So if you're relying on that, uh, we want to stop that. Uh, my CNF, uh, this is more just sort of somebody kind of tinkered around with your configuration and is probably not optimized. Uh, there's probably a lot of things that you want to go through and remove from there, or maybe some things that were more relevant back in the day aren't going to be relevant going to over to RDS. Uh, for example, uh, like if you're doing Aurora, NODB, buffer pool, uh, like the instances, you don't have any control over that, so go ahead and remove all that stuff. Uh, Legacy Magica, that's just more so if everything is more tied into like uh, on-premise architecture uh, for some of those more robust databases like Oracle again. If you have like a lot of physical constraints, moving to Aurora can be a little weird. Uh, UTF-8, uh, if we are using like Latin 1, stuff like that. Data, if, if we're going for globalization, I would recommend using UTF-8 just because you're going to be able to successfully store a lot more characters than you would Latin 1. Uh, but there also is the drawback that, you know, you're going to have more bytes to deal with. Bigger size, I guess, if you will. Uh, and the last thing is that databases used to be uh, snowflakes. You know, we treated them really carefully. We still want to do that. Uh, the difference is now is that they are cheap, uh, especially in RDS. Read replicas, you get up to 15 with Aurora, uh, and you can do further bin logging on top of that. Uh, so spin up as many as you need and get used to the idea that that's not a problem. Somebody in your department needs a new database, like you've got... I don't know, legal or something, or marketing, and they want a read-only replica, just give it to them real quick. Uh, biting the bullet. I, I like that quote. You don't have to be to step forward to be a hero. Everyone else just has to step back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are just kind of my personal things when I'm doing a database migration. Uh, sorry about the small text there, by the way, guys. Uh, if you guys are Star Trek fans at all, uh, Scotty and LaForge are the two engineers. Anytime the captain says something, they give some inordinate amount of time, and he'll re you know, come back with way less time. So just try and give yourself as much time as you can for database migrations. Uh, just to account for the unforeseeable, there's always going to be some kind of snag. It might be with replication. It might be with schema. It could be just overall compatibility. Maybe we have a bunch of views and stored procedures that aren't going to work uh, in Aurora or uh, uh, RDS. Uh, backup everything. If you're a DBA, you're probably already doing this. Uh, take a full disk backup, snapshots of everything, uh, point in time restore. Uh, if it doesn't exist in two places, uh, it doesn't exist at all. Um, yep, giving yourself options. Uh, what I'm talking about here is more so in the course of the migration when you're staging things. Uh, keep multiple copies, copies of your SQL files. Uh, stage them in an EC2 instance, stage them in S3. Uh, you can use a data pipeline. There's a lot of different ways to kind of go about a database migration. So keep, keep yourself open to all those options. Some work better in other cases. Uh, putting the work, oh, using a, what works. Uh, again, this kind of ties back into like benchmarking tools and stuff. Uh, I've seen a lot of really fancy tools and highfalutin ORMs and things like that that claim to do a lot of things really well, uh, and they don't. Um, if you're using MySQL, use MySQL's utilities using Postgres, use Postgres utilities. They usually work fine for what you're trying to do. You guys are familiar with like Workbench and stuff like that. Uh, for Kona Playback, that was kind of an example of one of the benchmarking tools that just turned out to be completely broken. Uh, and they didn't have any uh, 
they didn't have any kind of public documentation. I actually had to find that out from one of them. Uh, so that's another thing is when you look at that stuff, go with what's up to date from them. They have a lot of older tools that they're not actively developing anymore. Uh, but the PT stuff is still in active development. So that all kind of replaces uh, Percona playback. Uh, that's just one example though. Uh, the work up front, uh, this is just more so give yourself ample time to prepare for things. Uh, a two week window, depending on how big your database is, might not be enough. Uh, Put yourself in a situation where you don't have to hurry doing this. Uh, if it's a deadline for some kind of version update or something like that, uh, try, and give your, try and give your DBAs as much of awareness as you can about that. Uh, it's just going to, the more time you give yourself, the more the time there is for unforeseeables, uh, less things that can go wrong once you've already got in production. Uh, the physical constraints, that's more so if you're coming from limited uh, bandwidth on-prem. Uh, and this is also going to tie into giving yourself enough time. Uh, you don't want to say that you can do something in a day, and it turns out that it's physically impossible because <laughs> of your resources. Um, the last point here is just more so that I get asked from a lot of people, uh, how can we make database migrations as easy as possible? Click a button, stuff like that. Uh, it should be a little bit tedious because if you just click a button, you're going to get careless. Something might happen. Uh, always err on the side of caution and err on the side of control when you're doing a database migration. Take things really slow. Look at everything as you're doing it. Uh, especially if your data is, it, it has to be crucial. It has to be uh, exactly as you get it. Uh, so here we're kind of just going over a few more things uh, that you can kind of aid, that aid you in a uh, database migration. Uh, you can use AWS's code pipeline uh, to import CSVs, stuff like that from S3. Uh, it can get a little bit expensive, but it is very fast. Uh, there's a couple good tools out there. Uh, I'm a Python guy. Uh, so I really like Odo. Uh, it just does transformations, and it's really lightweight. Uh, it takes advantage of uh, native loaders. Uh, so if you are going, uh, so we talk about MySQL here, uh, it'll actually use the load data local in file uh, under the hood uh, for those transformations. You can do things to CSV, uh, can do things to SQLite, uh, MySQL, um, MS SQL, I believe even. Uh, they've got a huge transformation page on their uh, GitHub. I would check it out. Um, the dumps in uh, S3, you kind of imported with Lambda. Uh, that's kind of like code pipeline a little bit. You're just utilizing Lambda now. Uh, Lambda is actually not too bad uh, at doing uh, migrations. And the uh, complex tables one at a time, uh, especially if you're going to Aurora, a lot of times uh, store procedures, views, triggers, uh, they won't migrate uh, manually. So you're going to have to go through, and I usually like to try and keep those sprocks with the table that they're associated with. Uh, so don't try and do any kind of bulk table, bulk database moves. It's good if you've got really stored, you know, if you've got a lot of stored procedures, do the table with the stored procedure one at a time. Uh, these are just some snippets, uh, kind of little things that I use just when I'm uh, doing database migrations. I always try and get the size of the database first. Uh, that's just a little snippet there for that. Uh, I always try and stage things in EC2 just to give myself a full Linux distribution with my data to work with in case I need to do any transformations, do it on the EC2 instance. Uh, and they're usually pretty quick about uh, loading stuff into RDS. Uh, RDS can't do uh, load local in file or anything like that because it's a service. Uh, so you have, to, you have to import everything from somewhere else. Uh, so if you've got like CSVs or something like that uh, that you want imported in, you would have to set up you know, a little bash script or use Odo uh, on your EC2 instance. Uh, the other two here, uh, exporting your store procedures and stuff, that's just a little snippet for kind of getting those all by themselves. Uh, you are going to need to, especially if you're going to Aurora, you're going to need to modify your store procedures to not have a definer uh, for the user. Uh, RDS admin is the actual Aurora user, uh, and everything basically has to just have that clause removed, uh, otherwise you're gonna run into permissions errors. Uh, and this last one's just for dumping to CSVs uh, instead of just doing a straight dump. Uh, and that's just more so if you want to parse it out, if you want to split up the CSV, if you want to kind of do uh, transformations on that, sometimes that's easier to work with. Uh, more preferential there, though. Uh, how to ensure that things don't work out. <laughs> uh, so I kind of, uh, statement replication isn't bad, per se. It's proven with MySQL. Uh, it works. I don't use it for replication uh, because not all DML uh, goes through statement. Uh, there's a little list. If anybody's curious, I can pass along that documentation for what won't carry over with statement. Uh, I use row 
despite the fact that there is more overhead, it's going to give you A equals B for everything. Uh, so the writing to the master, th so I'm also kind of uh, implying here that we're doing a live migration with no downtime. Uh, so with the writing, uh, at least when you're going to Aurora, if you are actively writing on your master and you're trying to migrate uh, to something else, you're going to put extra overhead on things. So if we can minimize writing to the app, to the master database while we're trying to migrate its data somewhere else, that's just going to make your bin log you know, not fill up as fast. We're going to have less to work through. Uh, if The other thing is with the uh, read replicas, at least, uh, based off of the largest instance size, that's the db r 3 8 large, uh, I noticed that those cap around 2,000 IOPS for replication, uh, despite your uh, write master actually exceeding that. So if you're replicating more to your master than your read replica can handle, you're never going to catch up. So you don't want to put yourself in that situation. Otherwise, you basically have to sit there, wait for Sunday night or whatever it is that's your downtime, and, and hope that that's enough of a dip that you actually catch up. Uh, nobody made sure it would work. Uh, nobody just did their homework. They tried to go from you know 5.1 to 5.6 or something like that. They didn't think about actual changes to schema or structure or anything like that. Uh, that I haven't really run into before, but I have gotten asked if there's like really old versions that you can carry over, and you're at, a, at a certain point you're not going to be able to. And the error handling, this is going to be more for if you are writing your own uh, import procedures. So if you've got maybe a Bash script or Python script or Node or what have you that's doing the import for you, you want to put error handling in there. The worst thing in the world is doing a database migration. Things look good, and you show up, and uh, it's been like erroring out, and you've been letting it go for a long time. So always give yourself some kind of uh, catch mechanism there. Uh, so Aurora is ideal for many types of applications, but not for everybody. Uh, in some cases, uh, I've, so between benchmarking, I've done uh, benchmarking between Aurora and MySQL 5.7. Uh, on a R3 ADIX large. Uh, so in certain cases, it actually does outperform RDS. Uh, and that's just from EC2. So that's not even MySQL RDS. That's just straight up EC2. Um, and I can uh, provide some benchmarking data on that if anybody's curious. Uh, the other thing is that the metrics can't be taken at face value in some cases uh, from like CloudWatch with Aurora. Uh, because everything is a service, you're going through an API with your requests. So when you're looking at IOPS for your databases, you're not looking at file I.O., you're actually looking at the I.O. for the requests. Uh, so that can be very misleading. Uh, I actually had to kind of talk to some AWS reps to kind of get to the bottom of that. Um, the other thing is that you're not going to get any super privileges on these databases. If that's a showstopper for you, uh, Aurora just won't be right for you. Uh, for some folks, it is. Um, the last one here, uh, suited for certain applications over, uh, yeah, it really does. For applications like WordPress, if you're doing, uh, you know, Something that's already been developed and kind of has its own database structure already kind of pre-configured into it, Aurora is perfect for that. If you want to you know, spin up a ton of those uh, you know, applications, it's really good for that. If you have a very particular build or application that is unique, uh, there are cases where it might not be right for you, especially things with uh, really high concurrent rights. Uh, for like a long time. So if you've got like uh, one example would be if somebody I thought of or somebody I've worked for would be uh, you take emails and you ingest those emails and you've got customers that are signing up that are also sending you their emails. That's going to keep getting bigger and bigger every day. It will not get smaller. So you won't have any drop in your traffic. Your traffic's only going to get more and more. For something like that, you might want to look at Dynamo or something else. Um, and yeah, the last point here, I kind of reiterate a couple times just because it's uh, pretty important to folks. Uh, sprocks, triggers, routines, uh, they might not migrate properly. Uh, so take a close look at those and make sure that they will. Uh, views as well, I don't mention views here, but views actually don't have any kind of export mechanism with MySQL at all, as far as I'm aware. Uh, you would need to kind of manually carry those over. Uh, so you're in RDS now. You've done the database migration. Uh, so the first thing you want to do, make it multi az It's a little bit more money. Uh, it's going to save you a ton of headache. Uh, if you need to modify parameter groups, or let's say you want to turn on bin log replication. Uh, so Aurora clusters in particular, uh, the read replica and the write master, uh, they share a logical volume. So there's no actual bin log replication there. 
Uh, that being said, you still can use binrog replication between uh, even Aurora write master and write master. Uh, so having your uh, databases multi-EZ, if you need to turn on bin logging, if you need to do fine tuning, if you need to update something, uh, if you need to make a schema change, having it multi-EZ just makes it so that you don't have to worry about any downtime while you're doing that. Uh, shard like mad. Uh, maybe you didn't shard, uh, and now's a good time to start since you're in a new place. <laughs> It's always good to start sharding. Uh, it's going to make things way easier down the line, uh, even if it means doing a little bit of math. You can even just do it simply, shard by function. If you've got uh, certain tables that are going to be hit by certain functions, more often than not, you've got uh, limitless databases now. You might as well just give it its own instance. Uh, make replicas. Replicas are really cheap. They are extremely easy to spin up. It, it's a couple clicks of the button, uh, as is everything operationally in Aurora. Uh, so spin up replicas for anything you need if you want to do any kind of testing, if you want your developers to each have their own uh, data database to work with. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, snapshotting. Snapshotting is pretty good in uh, RDS. Uh, I think it's up to 35 days that you can do snapshot retention. Uh, those are incremental snapshots, uh, so they're going to save basically the changes from each snapshot. Um, outside of that, uh, you can totally use like Lambda or something just to do other kind of uh, exports of your data if you want to store that somewhere else long term. Uh, Route 53 is really nice also for failover. Uh, the names that you're going to get for your databases are pretty nasty looking. They've got like a random hash in it and stuff. Setting up a Route 53 endpoint for all of your databases just lets everybody hit just a nice clean FQDN. Uh, in case you need to change what's behind that, it's way simpler to change a FQDN than it is to uh, reconfigure a database on the network. Uh, Fine-tune your parameter groups. Uh, so now you've got the ability to create multiple sets of parameter groups uh, for multiple databases. So if you've got a production database that you need to be set up for high concurrency writes, uh, you've got a reporting database, uh, you've got you know, metadata, archiving, you need to make schema changes on something, uh, make parameter groups for all those things. Uh, this is just more. Also, I apologize for the terrible formatting there. It didn't look like that earlier. Uh, so within the VPC, you're going to get a huge advantage uh, networking-wise uh, and performance-wise. Uh, the VPC is uh, really nice. All it requires is just giving yourself a subnet that your RDS instances can reside on and giving yourself an EC2 uh, security group that all your EC2 instances can talk to. Uh, I believe now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Lambda, because it has uh, VPC capabilities now, will eventually be able to reach out to your RDS instance. So if you want to use something like it does, okay, cool. So yeah, if you want to use Lambda to reach out directly to your database and stuff like that, all that's going to become possible now. So all those tools that are starting to hit the VPC, uh, it's just way more worth it to use that. Uh, CloudFormation. Uh, so CloudFormation uh, is excellent for spinning up your databases. Again, you can totally spin up uh, you know, a little Lambda that automates all that stuff for you. Uh, the one thing I learned that is a little strange right now uh, with CloudFormation, uh, as well as Bodo, uh, with RDS instances, <laughs> uh, is they do not include the stored encrypted Boolean character or the KMS key ID uh, for encrypting your databases. Uh, the issue with that is that in order to create an encrypted database or cluster in RDS, you have to encrypt at the cluster level. Uh, because they don't have that available in CloudFormation at the cluster level, only the instance level, uh, you can't actually do that right now. Uh, they've got an internal feature request, as far as I understand for that. Uh, but you would have to use uh, either the Node SDK or the Java SDK if you wanted to automate uh, spinning up encrypted clusters. Um, and yeah, do something better with your time. So if you're one of those people, one of those old-fashioned DBAs who has a laundry list of things you've got to get done every day to make sure things go right, uh, now you have the tools and the environment at your disposal uh, to do better things with your time. So if you want to focus on Innovation. Now you don't have to worry about maintenance. You don't have to worry about partitions failing over. You don't have to worry about RAID breaking on you, things like that. That's all taken care of for you now. Uh, so I didn't mention MS SQL here, just because I don't work with it too much. I don't want to tell you things <laughs> that I'm not too knowledgeable on. Uh, if you are doing a database migration with MS SQL, uh, there is a EC2 instance that you can request that will allow you to do a MS SQL to whatever other kind of database you would like migration. Uh, there are some gotchas with that, uh, specifically with the blob objects uh, that are you, you want to be aware of if you do that. Uh, the database migration service, as far as I understand right now, does not do MS SQL yet. 
Uh, and yeah, that's the QA, awkward silence, and pizza time. Uh, and I also wanted to say, yeah, again, uh, if you guys have any questions about fine tuning, uh, I didn't have uh, time to put that in here, uh, but if you have any questions about, you know, uh, anything you would see in, I guess, like your my CNF file, uh, feel free to ask, and I can also go over that stuff too. M MS SQL? Oh, okay. Yeah. Honestly, the biggest benefit that I've found is really just operational ease. So if folks are worried about how they're going to automate their backups, uh, if they're worried about how they're going to maintain good uptime, uh, if it's hard for their developers to all work on the same date at the same time, you know, if, if it's like somebody has to kind of allocate time for who gets the database at what time so there's no, you know, merge conflicts or what have you, or no, I guess, row locking or something like that, uh, the ability to spin up the replicas is really nice. Um, if you want to do bin log replication outside of RDS, it's still possible. So let's say you've got something on-prem, you've got something in RDS, and you still want them to reflect each other. There's no issue, that, there's no reason that you can't replicate between those still. And uh, because, at least with Aurora, uh, if you're doing, if you're going with that, uh, the bin log replication and the, uh, the fact that they run off of an LVM, you don't get as much overhead. So you're still going to be able to have a little bit more robust of a production and still be able to replicate off of it. So there's, there's a different lot, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, but the biggest one is just operational ease seems to be the one that really uh, is the biggest benefit for most people. It just makes it very easy to manage all your databases, puts it in a very you know easy to look at interface, uh, and it's got a lot of uh, it's got like a good API behind it and stuff. So there's there's a ton of benefits to it. Uh, I think I, I can make it available. Oh yeah, sorry about that. So that was just the benefits of moving to uh, on-premise to uh, RDS. What are the what are the biggest benefits? And I, I would say yes, operational ease of use. Gotcha. Just if, if you've got like a like a two terabyte database or something like that, uh, that's kind of where like sharding by function uh, has really come into play for me. Uh, there really isn't a good way though. If you've got a massive uh, data set and you've got like a limited uh, pipe uh, to work with, you really just kind of want to find you know what your what your average is going to be and allocate time for that. Um, Usually what I do is I, s I will try and sequester tables that aren't really necessary for the function of the application. So if you've got uh, maybe metadata or archived tables or something like that, usually I'll just try and split those off uh, and do it table by table. Uh, that way if it's uh, you know something that's crucial to the function of the application, it's there. But if it's just like reporting or something, we can, we can move that over later. Uh, but for really big data sets like that that aren't uh, split out evenly table by table or something like that, no, there's not really a good good way around it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so loading from S3 is really nice, just because it's really, really fast. Uh, especially if you are. Uh, I've only done it with uh, EC2 instances. Uh, I've heard you can do it really well with data pipeline as well. Um, but it's really, really fast. Yeah. If you've got like a, uh, I would recommend using like a higher compute instance. Um, just so that it goes a little bit quicker. Just because you need to load things in from S3 need to have a larger instance for that. And then, yeah, you want to have something with a really good network throughput, so like one of those R3 instances. Uh, and that'll get it done fairly quickly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not quite there yet. Uh, just because, uh, at least with my experience, uh, I used it going from uh, MS SQL to Aurora. 
Uh, and it made uh, quite a few assumptions uh, about the data uh, that ended up causing problems. Uh, so like about the uh, like encoding the character set, uh, it would, uh, oh, uh -oh. I'm gonna type in for me. I guess we don't need now. Uh, the default values will uh, truncate like your large globs and blobs. Uh, so if they have parameters in there for that now, I haven't looked recently, uh, that would be a lot better. But when, it, when I was doing it originally, uh, it, it caused a lot of problems for that. Uh, the EC2 instance, uh, I usually use that one instead of the database migration service right now, uh, just because that one seems to have better support for MSQL. Or I should say it does have support for MSQL. Okay. Uh, I have not done any work from Oracle, but I do know that the EC2 instance does support Oracle, uh, so you can do you can uh, do a migration from Aurora to or uh, from Oracle to Aurora. Gotcha. Um, I would say the biggest difference is going to be uh, throughput, probably. So if we need to take a massive amount of writes, and we need them all to happen concurrently right away, uh, and we need that data available right away, um, something like Dynamo is going to be better th uh, for that. Um, the side-by-side -side, uh, with, with, you know, with, uh, with RDS compared to Dynamo, uh, you're just not going to get the writes. Uh, they're the same uh, amount of writes in the same amount of time that you will with Dynamo. Um, I used to have a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, I can try and look that up, or I can try and give it to you after this if you want. No, no, I'm saying if you're, if you're trying to get high, uh, high concurrency writes for like a ton of data all at once, uh, Dynamo would be better for that. Yeah. That'll, that'll have better IOPS. Uh, so if you need like um, something like taken off of a queue right away, if you've got uh, a service that's just constantly sending a ton of stuff or a lot of services that are sending something, yeah, Dynamo is excellent for that. Any more questions? Is that a question hand or are you just... Yeah, uh, <laughs> oh man, I don't want to start any fights. <laughs> I'm a Spock guy, but in the next generation. I'm actually still trying to get more hip to NoSQL. I'm kind of, an, kind of a relational guy right now. Uh, but no, I have not done anything with Mongo, uh, or at least migrating with Mongo yet. <laughs> we, we've all seen that. <laughs> The only time I probably wouldn't use NoSQL for something like that is just if you need uh, the data to be really reliable. If you need the data to be really reliable, uh, if you don't want to risk any loss of data, really. Um, so Aurora uh, only uh, does writes from the transaction log. So there's no issue of uh, we commit something before the transaction log actually goes through. So if you, uh, there's certain, there's like the NODB buffer pool uh, transaction commit setting. So if you have that at two, it's going to be really lenient. 
uh, it's basically just going to do it, it's going to be faster writes, but less reliable. You run the risk of like a loss of a second of data, I think. So if, if, that, if that loss is too much, you know, it's, for some people it really is if they're doing like reporting from a physical device or something like that. Um, then that's where you're probably going to want to stick with the relational database. Any more questions? No? Cool. And then again, yeah, if you guys want to go over parameter groups or anything like that, uh, fine tuning, uh, come talk to me.